In a world of man buns and millennials, one old school macho veteran holds the line. Cole Younger in Cole shuns the world. It's about things that tick me off. Some things I like, but mostly things that tick me off. Where is the next generation of macho men? I don't see them. But nobody cares about your hair when you're killing commies. You see, I'm a lone wolf. I live outside the pack. When a man opens up his shirt, a forest of thick chest hair should explode forth. This man fur is not only pleasing to the eye, but also provides warmth and signals to women that you're desirable. They're reading my mind now. What's next? Controlling my mind? Hey, Bob Munker. They're after me, Bobby. Bow ties tell the world, I'm a loser. I even served in combat. Shoot, I bleed red, white, and blue. I live alone and never leave my house. Seems like the world has lost its mind. Nothing makes sense anymore. So I withdrew from the world. That's right, I shunned it, shunned. Where is the next generation of macho men? I don't see them. Shoot, the women are more masculine than the men. <sighs> Why is he so angry? He needs to simmer down. It's not healthy. When I was growing up, men had moxie, true grit. Boys would watch these tough men and want to be just like them. Men like Lee Majors, Charles Bronson, Arthur Fonzarelli. I know Fonzie's not real. I don't care. Back then, men spoke with the fewest words possible. A nod of the head was practically a rant. Men let their actions do their talking for them. Nowadays, who's the male role models? Jason Statham, Vin Diesel, The Rock. Look, I appreciate their choice of hairstyle, but they're not on the level of John Wayne the Duke or Clint Eastwood. Shoot, Vin Diesel reminds me of vehicle identification number and fuel type. That's not a name. That's a car. And The Rock? Seriously, if you name yourself The Rock to sound tough, you're trying too hard. Oh, I love The Rock. He's such a dreamboat and so polite. You can tell his mother raised him well. Who you talking to, Edith? I'm watching the YouTubes. Nowadays, boys are told to share their feelings. Be sensitive, hug it out. What is this BS? No wonder the younger men are all tutti fruity. That's why everyone gets offended all the time. They're too sensitive. I was taught men kept their feelings to themselves. You don't share your feelings with other people. If you have a feeling, you push it down deep inside. You tuck it away and don't let it escape. Sure, later in life it eventually bubbles to the surface as high blood pressure, constant heartburn, and an uncontrollable urge to punch people in the throat. But that's what real men do. I like how the younger men share their feelings. 
Communication is the cornerstone to a good relationship. Listen, being a man and being sensitive is contradictory. A real man lets the hardships of life shape him. He takes the emotional rubbing and rubbing until a hard callus forms, a protective shield against further transgressions. Sensitive men don't develop this ability. They're offended and hurt by everything. Unfortunately, the rest of us have to hear them whining and crying. Lock it up. Nobody wants to hear that. Why is he alone? He's a good looking guy. You know what he needs? A woman. Growing up, we played outside all the time and we didn't have many toys. Sometimes we'd find a, a dirt mound and dig dirt clods out and wing them at each other. Dirt clods were these hard lumps of, well, dirt. Throwing rocks was strictly forbidden. However, in the heat of battle, sometimes mistakes were made and rocks were thrown. Did that mean that some of these fights ended with a trip to the ER for stitches? Sure, but it was all in good fun. Nowadays, these kids are wearing mouth guards, helmets, knee pads, everything but bubble wrap. It's like their parents put them in a protective cocoon. Parents check on them all the time, making sure nothing has happened to the precious little baby. Too much coddling. That's why they're so soft. I like this guy. He reminds me of a sexy Santa Claus. I'm gonna fix him up with my sister. Why are you gonna do that? I thought you liked him. Where was I at? I do. Then leave him alone. You wanna set your sister up with someone? Set her up with Isis. Use her evil powers for good. Don't punish this guy. Harvey, you take that back. What? She could end the war on terror. Oh, yes. Young men are being taught it's okay to cry. Wrong. There's only three times it's okay for a man to cry. One, at your mama's funeral. All others don't count. You suck it up. Number two, death of the family dog. This includes watching the movie Old Yeller. And number three, when you win gold at the Olympics. That's it, no exceptions. Okay to cry. Do you think when these boys are grown, women are gonna respect these crying men? Sure, that's what they say they want. But when it comes to some real adversity, they're gonna drop those wimps and get with the real man. One that takes care of business. Do you realize married men live longer? I'm calling my sister. What's this guy's email? I have to warn him. In all honesty, it's not their fault. This new generation of men is just a product of this new messed up world. I could go on and on about this subject, but I'd be just as bad as these manby pamby men. In conclusion, I shun these modern sensitive men. I shun them. You've been shunned. I'm so tired of this upside down, politically correct world that I shunned it. That's right, shunned. Before I get into this, I want to clarify. I don't condone wanton violence. I believe you try and talk it out first, and violence is a last resort. His giving advice? This should be a choice. When I was growing up, not every kid got along with each other. Occasionally, kids would have a beef with one another, and they'd settle it in the schoolyard. In case you didn't know this, six and seven-year-olds can't fight where the dog turns. Most don't know how to throw a punch or even make a fist for that matter. Thumb on the outside, by the way. So no real physical damage was done. 
In most cases, one or both fighters would turn their head to the side and blindly swing their arms like a windmill. Very few blows landed and most fights were over in less than 10 seconds. In the end, the loser left crying, but it built character. His advice is horrible. As a doctor, I have dedicated my life to psychiatry and this man is a Neanderthal. Nowadays, kids are taught to tell a teacher or adult, let someone else solve your problem. Verbal or physical, just tell someone. I get it. I'm not a fan of grade schoolers fighting. Unfortunately, this type of tell an authority figure to solve your problem carries on through high school and adulthood. A real man stands up for himself. Fighting is a sign of much deeper problems. For instance, if a child gets into a fight with another child because he took his lollipop, the child probably wasn't nursed long enough as a baby. Or it could be a much deeper issue. It is never something so mundane as one child just wanted the lollipop. <laughs> Back in the day, a bully picked on you. You stood up for yourself. You told the bully to lay off. If the bully kept up, and things got physical, you defended yourself. You let him know there was consequences if he messed with you. At the very least, you got a few good licks in. Did the bullies win? Yeah, but sometimes they didn't. Win or lose, the bully knew not to pick on you again. If there was a chance a bully could get hurt, he didn't mess with you anymore. At least that was the way it was back then. Listen. There used to be a code to fight. Two people would face each other. Their buddies would make sure no one else would jump into the fight. And the two would square off, mano y mano. When the loser looked like they'd had enough, their friend would jump in and the fight was called. That's it. Spectators got a show and the dispute was solved. Today is different. I see these videos online of people acting like savages, like they're, like they're possessed by the devil. One person starts a fight and like a pack of hyenas, his buddies jump in and pummel the one guy or girl within an inch of their life. No honor. Just like animals. It's disgusting. This is just the inner child's frustration with the outside world. Since they don't know how to express themselves, it comes out as violence. I truly feel sorry for them. They are the true victims. I wish I had an answer for this behavior, but I don't. I will give you some advice. In the past, most fights ended up on the ground. The two combatants wrestling until the end. Because of this, most fighters learned some wrestling. But with the way these degenerates and all their buddies pile on a guy, ending up on the ground could be a death sentence. It doesn't matter how good a wrestler you are, you can't wrestle three or four guys all at once. If you're in this situation, try to defend yourself and get away. But whatever you do, try and stay on your feet. What a simpleton. Defending is offending. Look, there will always be bullies and evil people that want to physically hurt you. Maybe it's for money. Maybe it's because of your race or how you look. Maybe they're sexual weirdos. It could be anything. Evil people don't really need a reason. Sometimes hurting people is entertainment for them. I don't believe you just roll over and let them destroy you. You defend yourself. In the martial arts, you develop might for right. In the army, 
You pray for peace, but prepare for war. Learn to fight. Knowing how to fight doesn't mean you have to use it. But if you need it, you got it. Fighting is never the answer. Just use your words. Words. In conclusion, a man stands up for himself and tackles his problems head on. I shun today's wussies. I shun them. You've been shunned. Enough of that. This is the time I'd like to go over some comments from previous episodes. Here's one from Edith. I saw you on the YouTubes and think you would be perfect for my sister Ethel. She is very pretty. Among my sisters and me, she has the lightest mustache. Here, here's her number, but don't call on Monday and Thursdays. Monday is bingo night, and Thursday Ethel works as an embalmer for extra cash. People think it's crazy, but it came in handy with her last four husbands. She saved lots of money by doing the embalming herself. Um, <clears throat> oh, and uh, then there's a reply from a man named Harvey. He says, don't do it. I thank you, Edith. I'm flattered. She sounds like a real gem, but I can't. You see, I'm a lone wolf. I live outside the pack. I can never settle down or conform to society's rules. To me, settling down would be like getting my wolf paw stuck in a bear trap. I'd struggle and struggle to get my wolf paw free, but eventually, I'd chew my own leg off to escape. Settling down just ain't in me. If you're just tuning in, I live alone in peace and quiet. I got tired of people and the world today, so I shunned it. That's right, shunned. <laughs> Check out this hillbilly dude. Make moonshine mm. much. Men today are more concerned about their appearance than women. Men shave and trim their hair to look perfect, spending way too much time in front of the mirror. A real man spends no more than three seconds in front of the mirror. Do I have a booger hanging out my nose? Is there food or, or dirt on my face? No? Then walk away. That's it. Anything more than that is just tutti fruity. Dang, bro! It takes longer than that just for me to comb my locks. <laughs> Good thing you're bald, bro, Seth. Recently, men were shaving off all their face and body hair, tweezing and plucking and waxing. Ridiculous. A man's supposed to be hairy, it's a sign of virility. A lion doesn't shave off its mane. Why should a man? When a man opens up his shirt, a forest of thick chest hair should explode forth. This man fur is not only pleasing to the eye, but also provides warmth and signals to women that you're desirable. They see that you can survive and protect them in the harshest environment which is always a turn on. Ooh, gross, bruh. What are you, a caveman? No mama Sita wants that. A manly man always wears a beard. Now I've noticed some of you have patchy beards. Stop. If you can't grow a full plush beard, then shave it off. Real men see a patchy beard and sense weakness. I, for one, was blessed. I had a full mustache in the fifth grade. Fellow students and teachers were envious. They dreamt of having a mustache like mine. People said I looked like a young Burt Reynolds. 
Most of the time, facial hair is manly, but there is one exception, the handlebar mustache. It's far too flamboyant. The only time it's acceptable to wear a handlebar mustache is when you're wearing a top hat and monocle like the Monopoly guy. Wearing handlebar mustache without the other stuff just isn't right. It's like Pavarotti without the other tenors. Something is missing. Dude, my girlfriend loves my patchy beard. I think it makes her feel young again because she says it reminds her of when she first started dating boys. Now, I have to admit it. I'm ashamed to say it, but I have trimmed my hair. I knew it was wrong, but I, I, I had to do it. You see, when you get older, hair starts sprouting out of the weirdest places. My nose hair started growing. I didn't mind it at first. I thought it would just grow into my mustache and give me a more fuller, thicker look. But it turned out this new hair is made of some super slick, strong fishing line or something. I tried pulling it, but it wouldn't budge and my finger slid right off. I tried using my fingernails and then I began to involuntarily cry. Shameful. As you know, there's only three times a man cries and this wasn't one of them. <clears throat> I had to resort to a nose hair trimmer. He's really bearing his soul. You go, old dude. Share your pain with us. How can a guy call himself a man when he's wearing a man bun? So unmanly. Your hair shouldn't be that long. A man's hair should be within military regulations. Off the ear and off the collar. Period. If you're truly high speed, low drag, you shave your head bald. Wearing a man bun makes you look like an old school marm. Now, some of you are saying, Cole, Rambo had long hair. True, but nobody cares about your hair when you're killing commies. Why are we taking hairstyle advice from a bald dude? Let's talk about men's fashion today. I want to compliment these boys. They brought about the untucked shirt movement. Nicely done. A real man wears unconstraining clothing for comfort and freedom of movement. You never know when you might get into a scrap or have to run into a burning building and save someone. You sure don't want your clothes slowing you down. Here I go complimenting you on the untucked shirt movement. And then you screw it up with skinny jeans. Seriously, these jeans make you look like a chick. Nothing about them says freedom of movement. Shoot, how do your boys even breathe? I would discuss this further. But since I don't know if we're in mixed company, I don't want to violate the proper conversation decor. Are you crazy, bruh? It lets the ladies see the outline. A real man's everyday wardrobe consists of regular jeans, a flannel shirt, and t-shirt. For special occasions such as church, court, or wooing a lady, a man wears a suit with a tie. That's right. You don't go this far and wear a suit without a tie. This isn't Saturday night fever. And when I say a tie, I don't mean bow tie fancy pants. 
bow ties tell the world I'm a loser. Sure, Doctor Who can wear a bow tie. He can pull it off. You can't. Dang, bruh. Quit harshing my mellow. Let me give you young guys some advice. You've heard of dress for the job you want? Well, dress as the man you want to be. In conclusion, I shun these manscaping metrosexual junk. I shun it. You've been shunned. I got tired of people in the world today, so I shunned it. Shunned. Seems like everywhere you turn, there's some new high-tesh doohickey. About the time I figure out how it works, there's a new one to learn. It's never-ending. I finally gave up. If you want to learn how some computer thing works, ask a 10-year-old. Today's episode, the neighbor kid Bobby's going to help me out. Say hi, Bobby. Hi! Bugger eaters. Bobby, this isn't that type of show. Please excuse him, folks. He's new here. A man's lawn is a direct reflection of his integrity, the cut of his jib, and his very soul as a man. A real man doesn't let his lawn go to hell. That's right, I said it. Because it's that important. Any man who has a patchy lawn full of weeds and rocks is not a man. A real man provides a thick, plush lawn for his family. Period. Anything less is a man of low moral character. Settle down, Pops. Just grass. Because you're young, I'm going to ignore that. For those that weren't raised right, Bobby, I'm going to give you some tips on how to have a great lawn. The three essentials to a luxurious lawn are mowing, watering, and fertilizing. For mowing, the key is setting your mower to the correct height. Only an idiot sets their mower to the lowest height possible. You're scalping your lawn, kicking up dirt and rocks like it's a garden tiller. Please, let me show you how a real man does it.
says he's sick of seeing you mowing your lawn in your bathrobe. Next time he's going to call the cops. Really? You tell your dad to come over and we can discuss it like men. Moving on. Proper watering is paramount. During times of drought, it's necessary to quench your lawn's thirst. Rich folks have these in-ground sprinklers that pop up and water for them. Lazy. I water my lawn redneck style. I set up sprinklers and let the kids run through it. It's great. Lawn gets watered. Kids have fun. Plus, I count it as their daily bath. <laughs> Since I don't have kids anymore, I, I do the watering with my dog Winchester. super cute. He's big. What do you feed him? Little boys that walk on my lawn. Ha <laughs> ha, good one. The last ingredient to a thick dark green lawn is fertilizer. Fertilizer provides the grass with nitrogen and nutrients to grow and stay healthy. Most people buy their fertilizer at the store and spread it across their lawn. Store-bought fertilizer looks like little tiny uh, yellow or light green beads. I prefer a more natural approach. All natural, right here, this is here, that's the good stuff. You can tell because of the dark, deep brown and the pungent smell that attacks the nostrils. You know from that, that this is gonna be a really good fertilizer. Way better than any of that store-bought crap. That's why I take it all natural. In conclusion, real men take care of their lawn. I shun these puny men and their patchy lawns. I shun them. You've been shunned. The world today is so messed up. I shunned it. That's right, shunned. Today's episode is called To Poop or Not To Poop. Harvey? Cole has another episode on YouTube. What's he ranting about this time, Edith? Something about pooping. That's just nasty.
Maybe he's got tips on stool softeners. Before I can share this very personal story with you, I need to educate you about an unspoken code men have for using the public restroom. Rule number one. When using a urinal, always leave an empty urinal space between you and the next guy. This is for privacy and splash protection. However, if there's no extra empty urinals available, it's okay to break this rule. Rule number two, eyes forward. You don't have any business looking anywhere except straight ahead. Nobody wants to pee with a looky-loo next to you. Rule number three, no talking period. No matter how much you want to talk, you don't chat with other people while they're going number one or number two. This isn't the ladies' room. What? Men don't talk in the restroom. Well, what do you do then? If you have a shy bladder or a fear of public restrooms, I suggest you turn this video off right now. Because the story I'm about to tell you will give you nightmares for the rest of your life. When I was in the army during the Persian Gulf War, I was assigned to the worst detail possible. Sh detail. Of course, I tried to dodge this assignment and was pretty successful. But, like the Grim Reaper, it eventually catches up. You see, we didn't have porta potties. We had four cedar outhouses. Inside these plywood boxes was a plank with four holes drilled out for toilet seats. And underneath were sawed off oil drums to collect the prizes. They weren't really prizes. The collection drums were used to collect poop, and used female sanitary napkins. Yeah, it was delightful. All day long, this fecal stew brewed under the hot Saudi Arabian desert sun, just percolating. <clears throat> the horrible smell was enough to make you puke. That's horrible. Those poor soldiers. Detail consisted of dragging out the full drums of feces and urine, some of which were filled to the to the brim. So you had to be careful not to slosh them and, and douse yourself. <laughs> Lucky for me that never happened. Because if it did, I would have used the company flamethrower to burn off my clothes and all of my skin. Anyways, we then loaded the drums onto a Hummer and transported them to a pit. From there, we would empty the drums and pour Mogas and diesel over them, uh, use a long rod or staff to stir it, mixing it real well, mixing the brown sludge real well. And then we would light it on fire. Whoosh! Fourth of July in shit town. If you made it through the video this far, I'm proud of you. But I gotta warn you, it's only gonna get worse. Because of the lack of privacy, I generally avoided using these outhouses. But after the shit detail experience, there was absolutely no way I was going to use them. Well, wouldn't you know, the day came when I didn't have a choice. I decided to hold it and wait until dark so I could take a dump in the outhouse alone. I like where this is going. Go Cole! Really, Harvey? 
Under cover of darkness, I snuck into the outhouse and closed the door behind me. The stench hit me like a wave and filled my nose and mouth. I tried to stay cool and not vomit, but I could feel it in the pit of my stomach. I looked at the four empty toilet holes and wondered which one should I pick. I walked past the first three holes and picked the last hole. Dozens of flies buzzed around the outhouse. I dropped my trousers, centered myself, and sat on the wood. You can do this, I told myself. You can do this. Flies buzzed around my head. I tried to swat at them, but it was no use. Some of them would land on my face and crawl around. I tried not to think about where they had been before. So I kept shooing them away. This is gross. I'm turning this off. No, you don't. I gotta find out if he drops that deuce. I tried to relax and block everything out. You can do it. You can do it, I told myself. Just then I heard the outhouse door creak and slam shut. Bam! I looked over to see Big Schmitty standing in the doorway, 6'6". He was a giant of a man. He wasn't skinny either. Big Schmitty was stocky and built like a Mack truck. Hunched over, he tried to avoid hitting his head on the ceiling. Big Schmitty slowly walked to find his spot. Well, at least I'm on the fourth seat, uh, the last one. He won't be near me, I thought. Fearfully, I watched Big Schmitty walk past the first hole. I tried to console myself. It's all right, Cole. Who wants to sit next to the door? He'll pick the next seat. Schmitty paused in front of the second seat. He peered inside the hole and looked at the fecal material in the barrel. Sit! All these seats are horrible. Just sit, I thought. And then he started moving to the third seat. The seat next to mom. What about the unspoken code I screamed inside my head? Leave an empty space between you and someone else. Surely that applies here. Big Schmitty dropped his drawers and lowered his butt to the wood. It was then that I felt it. Big Schmitty was so big, his butt was overflowing his toilet seat area. I could feel his butt cheek pressed against mine. Hold on, just give me a second. Oh my word, that's not right. I remember when we didn't have indoor plumbing, so we... Shh. Did you just shush me? Yeah, you don't think I've heard your outhouse story? We've been married 50 years. I've heard all your stories. I tried to focus, but Big Schmitty was practically on top of me. I remembered rule number two, eyes forward. Don't look, just block everything out and I started making progress, but then my mind darted back to the big man's, giant man's butt pressed against mine, the flies and the stench. And just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, Big Schmitty spoke. How was roving patrols, Cole? We were sitting so close together, I could feel his breath 
on my face. That's it. I jumped off like a rocket, grabbed my drawers with one hand, and ran out. I vowed never again. The next day we went on patrol. When the Hummer stopped, I got out. At this point, I didn't care who saw me. I was on a quest for bowel relief. With toilet paper in one hand, I dug a small hole, dropped my drawers, and squatted. In Saudi Arabia, the sand is so flat, you can see for miles. As I went, I watched some tanks rolling along in the distance. It was then that I, I had relief. This was much better than the outhouse. That's when my firing team thought it'd be funny to drive away with my Hummer. Wouldn't have been any big deal, but it turns out we were sitting next to this main supply route, MSR Dodge, and uh, morning rush hour traffic was starting up. Army truck after army truck, bumper to bumper, sped along on this eight lane makeshift highway. And there I was, taking a big old dump. Trucks and Hummers, uh, honked and blew their horns as they passed me. I didn't care. I just smiled and waved. Anything was better than that outhouse. That was the best and the worst Dookie experience ever. Wow! Can this guy tell a story? Who knew taking a dump of Ruski could be so suspenseful? I'll never understand you men and your toilet humor. I imagine most of the people with shy bladders and fear of public restroom didn't make it this far. If you did, I'm proud of you. So the next time you're relieving yourself and you don't have toilet paper, remember my story. Things could be worse. In conclusion, I shun outhouses, people who don't follow the bathroom code, and Big Schmitty. I shun them. You've been shunned. I got tired of everything, so I shunned the outside world. I shunned it. Up until now, I've been talking about all the things that tick me off. I haven't really talked about the things that I like. Well, here it is. The three things that I like most. America, Mama, and Jesus. Oh, you're one of those deplorables. Oh, glory. Good old red, white, and blue. I love America. This is the greatest country on earth. You can be a nobody with nothing and turn yourself into somebody with something. In the land of the free, your rights are protected by the Constitution. You have freedom of speech and religion. You can vote for your leaders and own a gun. Not to mention, this is the great melting pot. And I don't mean fondue. Immigrants from around the world come to this country, bringing their uniqueness and adding it to the great U.S. of A. How could you be proud of a country whose history is stained with systematic racism? Get woke! I love this country so much, I joined the army. I wanted to defend this country and protect our way of life. I even served in combat. Shoot, I bleed red, white, and blue. Unfortunately, being patriotic and loving your country isn't cool anymore. Instead, hating America and wanting to change it is. Shameful. Some people want to change this country from a constitutional republic to a socialist or communist country. Why? If you want to live like that, there are already countries out there. 
You can move there. Don't stick around here crying and complaining. Leave. Move to Venezuela. Move to China or North Korea. Follow your dreams. The distribution of wealth is unequal. The rich keep getting richer. They need to pay their fair share. Joining the military, you see firsthand how people in foreign lands live. Governments rule with an iron fist. People are born into poverty and have no chance of escaping. In some places, the basics like water, food, and shelter are luxuries to them. How can you complain about how bad America is when that's all you know? Ask a veteran, a Peace Corps person, a Christian missionary, and they'll tell you, you don't know how good you got it. This is coming from some privileged old white guy. I also love my mama. That's right. I'm a grown man and I'm not ashamed to say it. I was blessed with a great mom. Some aren't so fortunate like uh, Jason and uh, Norman Bates. If you saw Psycho and Friday the 13th, you know their moms was a real piece of work. I'm pretty sure those movies were based on a true story. Anyway, I digress. A real man loves his mom. Unfortunately, girlfriends and wives come and go nowadays, but a good mama only wants the best for you. She was there when you fell down and skinned your knee. She was there when that, that first girl broke your heart. She'll always be there for you. What a mama's boy. Grow up. Unreal. Of the three things I like most, Jesus is top of the list. Christ is King. He is my salvation, my Messiah, my Savior. Jesus died for our sins so we may have everlasting life. He has made changes in my life and pulled me through dark times. Look, I'm no preacher, pastor, or reverend. I'm just a simple man who loves the Lord. And if you don't know Jesus, you're missing out. Some of you are probably saying, Cole, you get fired up and talk tough. It's true. I won't deny it. I have some rough edges. There are worldly things that tick me off. I strive to be like Jesus, but I am far from it. The Holy Spirit urges me to do the right things, but I still mess up. To them I say, God isn't finished working on me yet. Looks like he has his work cut out for him. Lucky for me, I'm saved by his grace. Before I wrap this up, I want to mention one of my favorites that just came up short of this list, and that's guns. I love me some guns, pistols, rifles, shotguns. I love them all. Some people like to go hunting. I like to go to the shooting range and fire off a few rounds, holding the gun steady, lining up the sights, Smooth trigger pull. Boom, boom, boom. Smell of gunpowder and hot lead. Get your heart up humping. I'm guessing most people only hear gunshots in the movies. Let me tell you, it's much louder in real life. I remember taking my uncle Leroy to the firing range the first time. 
I shot my Colt 45 Desert Eagle. Boom. And Uncle Leroy about jumped out of his skin. Every time Big Bertha went off, Uncle Leroy would flinch. By the time we left, Uncle Leroy had developed this involuntary tick. Funniest thing you ever saw. Guns are the root for all the violence in the world. Guns should be banned. In conclusion, I love America, Mama, and Jesus. I love them. You are loved. Now, before you start thinking that I've turned soft and turned into some long-haired hippie, there are plenty of other things that tick me off. Next episode, we'll be back to my normal rank. I got tired of everything, so I shunned the outside world. Shunned it. When I was growing up, rough and tumble guys identified themselves by wearing tattoos, leather jackets, and riding motorcycles. Parents would see these warning signs and tell their kids to stay away from them. They were outsiders, loners, rebels, trouble. Nowadays, everybody has tattoos. Shoot, I think I saw a two-year-old with a neck tattoo yesterday. What happened to only tough guys wearing tattoos, leather jackets, and riding motorcycles? <laughs> It's the old hillbilly again. Some of these tattoos are works of art. Beautiful colors and shading, intricate line art, creative three-dimensional perspective. True masterpieces in every sense of the word. While others look like they were scribbled by a toddler hopped up on pixie sticks, all willy nilly. Come to think of it, these horrible doodles remind me of Sharpie drawings we used to do on the first kid that fell asleep at a slumber party. <laughs> Dude! Mountain Man doesn't know anything about tattoos. No, you're tattoo artist, bruh. It's like super important. Learn that the hard way. I asked for a whimsical pinwheel tattoo. What I got was a colorful Nazi symbol on a stick. People who have tattoos are always trying to convince you to get one. Like it's a cult. They say stuff like, um, it's addictive. Once you get one, you'll want to get more. Really? You need a more persuasive argument than that. When has addiction ever been a good thing? Huh, like I need another addiction. As it is right now, I can barely keep my chocolate and Netflix addictions under control. <laughs> I hear you. I'm addicted to tasty waves and babes, bruh. The closest thing that I got to a tattoo is my smallpox vaccine scar. I almost got a tattoo once. When I got back from the war, some of the guys from my platoon were going to get matching tattoos. I decided against it, though. Staying off the grid and such, I didn't want to make it easier for law enforcement to identify me. Seriously, this is for all the criminals out there. Do you realize you're making it easier for law enforcement to identify you? What did the suspect look like? Oh, he was wearing uh, jeans and a wife beater. Uh, and, and on his neck, he had this coiled up cobra. And uh, <clears throat> on his arm was a sleeve of a grim reaper riding a flaming big wheel. Oh, and then on his shoulder, he had a... Uh, Hello Kitty with the words Pookie loves Nuki underneath it. Thanks.
We need a bolo on uh, Charles Pookie Jones. That's it. You might as well be wearing a name tag on your chest. Tattoos are a form of self-expression, bruh. Even criminals need to express themselves. Some of those prison tattoo artists are like, really, really, like, crazy talented. I don't understand these tattoo quotes in foreign languages either. All these Asian Chinese symbols uh, with a super personal quote that only another person who reads Asian Chinese symbols is stupid. Why would you get that? Do you want a lifetime of people pointing to your tattoo and asking you, what does that say? Just get the tattoo, the quote, in your own language. If you gotta explain your body art, it's a failure. Who even knows if the tattoo artist got it right? Dude, you can't censor Chinese tattoos. That's against freedom of speech and stuff, bruh. You can write whatever you want. It's in the U.S. Constitution. Or, or would that be the, the Chinese Constitution? Of course, millennials have to take that to a whole new level, covering as much of their bodies as possible with tattoos. Some are even getting neck and face tattoos with eyebrows, nose, ears, piercings, for that little extra bling. And bam, unemployable. Wrong. It all depends on your career track. All these ornamental accoutrements are great if you want to be a rapper, stripper, a drug dealer, a fast food worker, a hairstylist, and so on. If these jobs interest you, then a face tattoo is a peachy idea. But if you want to be a VP of business, a neurosurgeon, investment banker, or some other professional job, I'd steer clear of the face and neck art. When's the last time you saw a Fortune 500 CEO give a shareholders meeting with a big dragon tattoo on the side of his face? That's discrimination, oh dude. People shouldn't be judged by their face tattoos. It could have been a really good idea at the time. Kind of like eating a gas station hot dog. Used to be only the bad girls got tattoos. You know, the girls that smoked cigarettes and said swear words. Good Christian girls didn't mark up their bodies. Not anymore. Teenage girls are getting dolphins on their ankles, hummingbirds on their wrists, uh, butterflies, and so on. It's a tattoo free for all. Tattoos are for everybody, bruh. Embrace the ink. I'm sure I'll get hate mail from all the tattooed motorcycle riding doctors and computer programmers whining and crying. If I do, you're only proving my point. You're not a tough guy. I can't stand how the world changes. It seems tattoos aren't for tough guys anymore. To the original tattoo wearing tough guy, I'm sad to say the mystique is gone. It died when 70-year-old grandma started getting tattoos. Unfortunately, they took away your uniqueness and you're just like everybody else now. Dang shame. <laughs> Thanks for the advice, Cole. I think I'm gonna get another tattoo. You're so smart, bro. In conclusion, I shun these wimpy tattoo people. I shun them. 
you've been shunned. If you like this video, share, like, and subscribe. If you didn't like this video, I don't care.